Hello, I think we're live now. Slight confusion there with the stream. Hang. Hello, that's me. Um, hi there, just tuning in. Kai Draper saying hello, Auntie. Um, Kai will be hosting tonight. Hupski from Norwich, Isaac, or is that Ellis? NR2. Carl and Kimberly Foster, hello. Helen Wells, Maggie Draper, tuning in from Whitstable, Kent. Um, anyway, thanks for holding on. There was a slight delay there at the start where we just worked out what order people are going to be speaking. You tuning in tonight to Assembly Online for the third international poetry reading, selected and hosted by Kai Draper. Um, Kai won't probably talk about himself too much, so just a quick introduction. Kai is from South London and he lives in Norwich. Before lockdown, he had been running workshops at the Book Fair. Um, I don't know if these will be starting up in some form at some sense. Um, he's got forthcoming publications from the Lighthouse Journal, Bad Betty Press, Leslie Magazine, Lamiga, and others. Um, I'm going to be back at the end to talk a bit more about two events we've got coming up in September. But I'm going to pass straight over to Kai now. Kai will be introducing each of the four poets as well as doing a few poems himself to start with. So hopefully a smooth change now to Kai. Hello. Yes, we're yep. good. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to these uh, marvellous readings. We've been putting on with Henry at the Assembly House. Um, I'm wearing, yes, I'm wearing a proper suit this time. I'm going to show you, look at this, shoes, uh, really um, overdressed for this occasion, but you know, it's all part of it, I feel. Um, please, you guys at home, say hello on the chat, um, on the YouTube chat. It really makes a difference to us who are kind of reading into a void. Um, we are poets. We, some of us are performers. We are used to people and vibes. Um, and obviously this is a, this platform does work, but it makes a big difference if you guys say hello. Uh, well, personally, for me, it does. I'm sure for the others too. Anyway, um, thanks for joining us tonight. We've got a really exciting lineup for you. Um, super stoked for everybody. Thank you to everyone, uh, all the readers, for joining us today. Um, have I missed anything? No, don't think so. So, yeah, I'm going to give you a poem from Miggy Angel, who couldn't be here tonight. He uh, had to pull out, um, which, you know, is sad, but we are very happy to have Patricia joining us from Switzerland. Uh, this evening. Um, I'm going to start by reading a Miggy Angel poem. Um, his book, Hour of the Dog, is very good. It's out with Salo Press, which is a Norwich-based press. Um, this book kind of took me by surprise. Uh, it's all about gentrification in South London, uh, not just South London, but my particular area. Um, and it hit me strongly. Um, and because Miggy can't be here tonight, I'm going to read a poem of his, then I'm going to read a recent poem of mine too. Then we'll hand over to the inimitable Rachel Long. Um, so this poem is called The Bird and it's from Miggy's book, Hour of the Dog. I had a bird once. The story begins. I was once a bird in dreams, asleep to my great, at the edge of reason, mist mutates presence, accumulates mysticism. The race to escape is a labyrinthian return to the garden. I had a bird once, the story ends. No one's hearse shall surprise the cemeteries. I was once a bird, I surprised the skies which I think is a very lovely poem. Um, 
Yeah. And now you've got to give it a minute for the silence to waft. It's very strange. My mum said I shouldn't comment <laughs> on, the, on the weirdness of the tech, but I have to every time, otherwise it's weird. Um, I'm now going to read you a poem. This is the first poem in a project I've been working on called Sprung. Um, all these poems were written in lockdown with two poets you heard at the last reading, Mira Matar and Ellen Dillon, two incredible writers who I was really kind of honoured to uh, communicate with in this way. Yeah, we shared, we shared poems for six weeks every day. It was amazing. Anyway, this is one of the first from that sequence and it's called Flare. The period of daylight formerly known as Thursday, like a tortoise wrapped in blank verse, nondescript praise from the manager, panic uncovered in the corners, hurrah! Haley, Raymond, Stacy and Pottage. That's what I'd call my first four babies born to a world of praise for the neighbours. Delivery dude in a van in a zoo. Registered nurse in a reified mask in a zoo. Breathe in. Life giving living to be filtering the toxins. Breathe out. Flush sing the savings to dash poison up the rafters. My sister six months pregnant and crying to the nursery. No midwife, no baby group, no mum on the due date cursing. No big massive hug. The very expensive bath scented, everything scented, birth plan centre of her perennial thirst for learning. Everything parallel, everything universe, everything muted between us cacophonic tones of the dream gaff in Clapton. I hope she is okay. We were remembering ourselves and my face is full of her. She can't see my face. Write a poem on a tortoise and blast it out of space. Cool. That's that poem. Thanks everybody. Um, and I'm just seeing on the YouTube chat now, yeah, great last line of that Miggy poem. Absolutely. Um, Miggy's an incredible writer. I really, really recommend you to check him out. Um, yeah. Ah, it's very strange. Anyway, um, I'm now going to hand over to Rachel Long. Rachel Long uh, is uh, an incredible poet, uh, but I'll read her official uh, words. Um, which are here. So Rachel Long is a poet and the founder of Octavia, which is a poetry collective for women of colour housed at the South Bank Centre in London. Rachel's poetry and prose have been published widely, most recently in Mal, Granta and the Poetry Review. Her debut collection, My Darling from the Lions, has recently been published uh, by Picador. It's incredibly exciting. Um, to have Rachel with us tonight. It's an honour. Um, also, she's just like a really, 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 really good poet. Uh, and I think I'll leave it there. Um, so Rachel, I'm now going to uh, do the business. Oh, no, wrong. That's on. We good? I think so. Cool. Can you see and hear me? Yes. <laughs> hey. Oh, God, I can see and hear myself now. My head's not. Um, thank you for that, Kai. Um, thank you for both those poems, both Miggy and yours. They're both stunning. There's something about listening while your camera's off and you're on mute. I haven't done that yet on Zoom. Um, and I can listen. On, a, on, a, on another level, so thank you very much. I also love you reading my bio in your, in your voice, Kai. I think I've just heard it in Southeast London, and I'm like, oh, you did good, girl, you did, you've done good. 
um, when it's said in another voice, it just it just kind of wafts. So thank you. Um, I have just published a book, Kai Tells No Lies. Um, I didn't send him any either. Um, and it's been really beautiful. I'm very grateful um, and excited in my weird way, which is like just crying a lot in my room or on my sofa. Um, but it's been really interesting to hear the, the poems that other people um, kind of tell you they like in the book. Um, and it's been, that's lovely, but also it's really interesting for me because I'm like, oh, really, that one? Okay. Um, so I'm going to read, actually, the ones that I wouldn't maybe usually read, um, but that people have said to me specifically um, that that kind of did something for them. Um, so instead of centering myself, even in the work, I'll try to still read my work, but center other people's way of reading. Um, and I'm also going to go backwards through the collection, because another thing that I do, and I'm trying to break habits at the moment, um, is not read uh, the way that the, the, the book reads. Um, it's in that order for a reason to me, um, but I'm going to try tonight to see what happens if I read backwards. Nothing's actually going to happen. Basically, this is still like a really narcissistic exercise. Um, this is called Self-Portrait with Baby. You don't even have a baby. Haven't wanted one for a decade. You did, not to hold, but hold over them, the boys you loved and wanted to keep. You wanted a good glue the most lasting, to render them unable to forget or delete you. Ew, those now men parking up, slamming doors, striding up your private path as they will next Friday and the one after, one after another, to your cottage door, knocking on the stained glass because they're still barbaric. You shudder, you must answer, pull your cardigan together, Open your smart black door. Don't let them in. Don't let them all the way in, but they're close enough already up the step on the welcome mat, train a toe cap or arrowhead of a smart shoe over the skirt in on touching your scrubbed up tiles. You pick the baby up from where she's been this whole time on the bench under the window. How could you have missed her? Cold, cute as a prawn in her pink brushed cotton. Blurry face, real hands, a hat, as if she comes with a carrier, a seat for a car you don't have and can't drive. The baby is yours. You know it like hunger. Hi, he says to his watch, ostentatious as ever, then reaches out, I'll bring her back Monday. You're weak but lift the carrier and hand her your baby girl over to him or to him or the other. They knock one after another to collect and collect your babies, which they say are also theirs. Your babies together, it's only fair. There were agreements you can't break, you mustn't break. So you hand her over and over the threshold and each time she goes, she just, goes um that poem came out of a dream i had um or not a dream it's more a daydream i was just standing in my kitchen of uh, my old my old old house and i was like oh my god all those dickheads i used to get with like and i so wanted their like babies at the time and i thought oh my god what if one of them knocked now because it's friday and it would be the weekend that they'd get the kid and I was like, oh my God, there could be so many knocks at that door for like these ghost children that we didn't have together that I wanted and where that want in energy goes. This is what I think about on Friday in my kitchen. And um, this one's called Danielle's Dad. Danielle's dad has magical pockets. People come from all over the estate. They pay and hurry away. We watch from our bedroom window. Through bunk bed bars, we pretend we're in prison. 
We ask Danielle, what sort of magic? She says, don't know. Danielle is not very clever. She thinks the Woolwich Ferry is the Titanic. Look, she said as we drove round the roundabout, the Titanic. Even mum pretended not to laugh. When Danielle is playing over, we can only pay cheat scrabble as she isn't very good at spellings or maths either. We just write our names, then add the letters together. Out of Rachel, Maria and Danielle, I am the winner. Sometimes Danielle's dad reaches into his pocket and yanks out a black lab puppy called Bo or a quad bike for JJ or lacy pink curtains for their screaming mum. But most often Danielle's dad yanks out fistfuls of coins, the most coins I've ever seen in a real life hand. When we're playing out with Danielle, he'll say, oi girls, go get some ice cream or something. We cheer, we shout, thank you, Danielle's dad. He doesn't even count it. Just pours the thick gold into our cupped hand till they bubble over. We skip towards the ice cream man. When we pay, we remember to cover our boobs with our other hand. We don't take a lick till we're back behind the garages. As he kisses my earlobe before bed, I tell dad, Danielle's dad is richer than you. I bet he is, dad says. Um, so the last poem then I'll read you this evening. Um, is um, one for my good friend B. And I feel like I've been uh, kind of talking to people a lot about how, how long you write these poems for and how many of them started like really like uh, drafts, not drafts, there were versions of the poem. Sometimes I read some of the poems in the book um, and I'm like, oh my God, I know that poem. I was trying to get to that poem years and years ago. If anything, I've always trying to be, try I've always tried, I've always been obsessed with like the same, if not similar things. And sometimes it's really interesting when you're reading a book back because it becomes a part from you in a different way to if the poems are on a laptop even, um, or printed out on a piece of paper. Um, and yeah, I think I was always trying to write this poem and really trying to get to what I, I meant and wanted to show in it. And it looks very different from all its younger sisters or younger girl versions of it. But here it is all the same. And it might grow up and be a, a something different um, later. The clean. The clean white bowl of it, the pile of it. Imagine eating all the snow you've ever wanted in one sitting and not even having to pay for it. The avocado of it, toast butter cascade in your fingers, pink Prosecco, you'd be spaced out, clucking, grumpy, sexless, you'd die without this, clutching your ribs in the dark, one street from home, footsteps, gathering. I know a place that is snow falling from an Artex ceiling into a room you will never return to. A promise, piling like cable knit, four ply snow day snow. I know a place where the sad cannot go, where it will never have the right footwear. Here you can throw it all in. Go on baby, give it back to whence it came. Dispel three dinosaur dinners like forgiveness, like it never happened. Bile is the bottom, ground zero. There is no more after, no more. Girl, you can be new. Surrender it all into this one bowl. This, your hollow. Thank you very much. I don't know what I mean. Oh, I get silenced, I keep it. <laughs> yeah, you're fine, Rachel. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. That was really, really beautiful. Unbelievable. Yeah, amazing poems. Oh. It's, <laughs> it's really... <laughs> 
it's really, really, it's really, really lovely to to hear them in real life and see this book taking flight. If you know what I'm saying. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say bye to you. Um, feel the love, Rachel, on the YouTube chat. There's a lot coming through. Uh, yeah, cool. Okay, we will now move on to Andre. Um, Andre Bergou is the author of four books of poetry, including Burn and Pitch Lake, which is the book I first read of his, which, uh, you know, I sort of, sort of found Andre through that book. It's incredible. Um, his, his new book, which is the official launch date, is today. Uh, so we're very, very fortunate to have Andre with us uh, all the way live from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, this book of essays that he's going to read from is called The Undiscovered Country and is published by Peepal Tree Press. His website is andrebagu.com. Um, and uh, I will now well, do the thing. Are we there? Hello. Hello. All right, I'll pass over to you, Andre. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kai, for that introduction. And thank you as well for sharing that amazing uh, work and for giving us uh, and reminding us that sometimes we need space uh, in between listening to poems because the silence at the end of a poem is very different from the silence at the beginning. Um, and thank you as well, Rachel, for sharing your amazing work. I'm certainly looking forward to reading My Darling from the Lions. Um, and yeah, so I, I am a poet, as Kai mentioned, um, but today is also the official publication day of my new uh, book of essays. And I thought I would read an essay about uh, a poet. I've written in the past about um, many different poets, um, including poets from Trinidad, like uh, Fanny Capaldio and Shivani Ramluchan. Um, but the subject of this essay and the title of the essay is uh, the poet's name um, is actually from Jamaica. Aishan Hutchinson. First, he writes it all out on a yellow legal pad. The language flows pages and pages. He works on a red wooden desk made from a repurposed door. He sits daily at this desk, up early in the mornings at 6 a.m., watching light rise over buildings in the distance. He's not in Jamaica anymore. This is Salt Lake City, Utah, a place where he finds no water, no sea. Instead, he creates an ocean for himself right there on the page. His images cascading, taking orbital motion, swashing, breaking, foaming, releasing ideas as the wave throws up its flotsam. He writes draft after draft, fluidly over weeks, then types it all up, prints it all out. By the 10th iteration, he senses he might be a little closer. He cuts, 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 more cuts. Themes are condensed, strands taken up, until years after he began, he arrives at a place that matches his intuition about what this poem should be. I needed velocity, he said, velocity that could be so rapid as if it were mad brush strokes on a canvas in which the narrative is only within the strokes, the story crystallized to the point where it does not stand anymore and all that is left is the speed of it. The resulting poem tells us something about him. At night, birds hammered my unborn, it begins. It 
continues over the course of 14 lines that move with the velocity of water into a stunning transformation. I smashed my head against a light bulb and light sprinkled my hair. I rejoiced a pui, tree hit by the sun in the room, a man, a man. This became the center of House of Lords and Commons, a collection that conjures through words the turbulence, erosion, motion of the sea. Hutchinson was in Port of Spain some time ago to take part in the inaugural Derek Walcott Festival, a series of events put on by the Walcott Estate to commemorate the late Nobel Laureate. He sat in the lobby of the Kapok Hotel, a one-time haunt of Walcott's, wearing a striped shirt from the Gold Coast. Just as his fashion crossed boundaries, so too has done the poet. Since starting to write in Port Antonio, Jamaica, his poetry has taken him to places such as Baltimore, New York, Rome, London, Berlin. But his exploration of the world began closer to home. Trinidad was the first place I ever traveled to when I was in my first year at UWE, the University of the West Indies, Hutchinson told me. I spent a summer in Tobago. It's the surprise of poetry that I've been all over. It makes you a traveler. Yet no matter how far the journey, he always returns to one place. I was born in Port Antonio in a little town on the eastern section of Jamaica in a parish called Portland. His mother, Ermine, and his father, Ira, were Rastafarians who worked in the Port Antonio market. Poetry was not a word at the forefront of life, but the spare of language was. Ermine would set exercises in hummingbird copybooks for her children. She would start a story and I would pick it up. I was eight years old at the time. My mother worked a lot with making things. She would crochet and knit. More threads for his passion would be added when his father, Ira, moved to London. We wrote each other, Hutchinson said. This kind of communication was part of my young childhood. In one letter, I was trying to figure out my own ambitions, and I wrote that I wanted to be a journalist. The letters were weekly, from nine years old up to sixth form. So whether in letter form or through discrete exercises, a feeling for narratives of becoming emerged. Hutchinson's close relationship with his grandmother, May, was also pivotal. She was a quiet woman, very reserved. She always liked and preferred to be by herself. I clung to her. May was a baker and Hutchinson went to live with her for extended periods. In my work, there is the ghost of a place, he said. I always seem to be writing from the same place, which is specifically the landscape I grew up in, particularly my grandmother's house, which is built on a hill in Port Antonio. This house overlooks the sea in a sense, my stirring into language was this specific place. This is the nucleus. Everything grows out of that. In front of this view, the sea has a visual limit and it seems as if something you could walk down to and arrive at. But in fact, any kind of movement towards it results in it moving away. There is always this chase, as if I am lured to chase that image of water. Hutchinson might well be describing the effect of his own poetry. Even when ostensibly addressing subjects that do not relate to the coast, such as station or anthropology from his first book, Far District, 
Its lines embody the ebb and flow, the multitudinous forces within the crest of a wave. Meaning and narrative are telegraphed and undermined. We surf and dive until we get a sense of the poet himself plumbing the depths, retrieving truth from the interstices of the complex play of waves. Little wonder Hutchinson has thus far received several awards. All of it has allowed him to deepen his love of language. West Ride Out, a poem published in the fall 2017 issue of the Poetry Review, shows a writer committing even more unequivocally to a radical embrace of prose within the framework of flowing lyricism, turning back to John Donne, yet moving forward into a line that is as sensual as it is broken. And love grows angel in the gloom, it begins, with your calls through resistant stars. In his language, the poet seems ever nearer to transforming at long last into seawater. Amazing. <laughs> oh, Andre, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. Yeah, wow. Kind of like, um, kind of like an extended interview slash review slash reflection slash a lot, a lot of things going on there. Yeah, and I think that's, that's certainly something, um, Poets do, even in uh, whether it's in uh, the, a poem itself or in when we write about other uh, things, I and mean, that's something all writing does. But it's it's I think it's very particular, I guess, to, to poets this idea of roaming and uh -huh. kind of working out ideas, um, even if we can't label it uh, in terms of genre. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. It's a pleasure. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from the other poets. Cool. All right. Well, on that note, um, hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, we're now going to welcome Jackie Bangkong Obi uh, to the stage. Jackie uh, writes from Abuja in Nigeria. Her poems have featured uh, or are forthcoming in London Grip, the Kalahari Review, Amber Flora, Remember that? Zaf Poetry, um, Gutter Magazine, Hobart Pulp, Pigeonholes, uh, and Memento, an anthology of contemporary Nigerian poetry, which is where I first read Jackie's poems, um, which is a really, really good anthology. I recommend getting that. Um, Jackie can talk to you maybe a bit more about how to get your hands on that. Um, she enjoys long walks, yoga, and dabbling in nature photography. You can find her on Twitter at Jackie B5. Um, I will now hand over to the mighty. Are we getting there? Jackie, are you with us? There you are. You're still muted. Okay, no, no, there you are. No. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, okay, Jackie. Hi, guys. Hello. So, first of all, let me start by um, really, really, you know, saying how much of an honor it is for me to read with everybody. I mean, I know Rachel's poems from um, Mal Journal, and then um, I think Patricia and I have like this history. I don't know if she knows that. <laughs> Because I actually am a relatively new poet. I started writing last year. And one of the first places that I submitted my work was actually Amber Flora Zine. <laughs> so, and of course I got a rejection first, but subsequently the next window I submitted and they um, took the poem and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And for me, that was like the point where I felt I could really do this. So Patricia in her own right is like an idol of mine. 
So thanks everyone. Andre, I really enjoyed your essay. Thank you so much. I'll be looking at exploring your writing. So I'm gonna be reading, um, the poems I'm gonna be reading, Nostalgia in Vibe, was published earlier this year by Gotha Magazine uh, for their 21st issue, which was a spotlight on writers of color from Scotland and around the world. If you have any inkling about um, our history here in Nigeria, our political history, you know that we had this long period of a, like the military era, you know, and that's the time I was born into. I was born into that, you know, that period. And but not just that, I sort of um, spent the first thirteen years of my life, you know, in some barrack or the other. So that regimented and sort of stifling environment was the environment that I grew up in. But on the other hand, as an African, I think it's an African thing, there's this thing about movement, you know, about song, about the dance, you know, there's just something about it. We sort of react to everything with, you know, with a song, with a dance. When we are happy, we love, we celebrate, we dance, we break, you know, we break into song and all that. And even when we are grieving, if you've ever tried to watch anything from whether it's our movies, our songs, you know, we celebrate, we, we, we do the burials, the ceremonies, we dance, we send our dead into the afterlife with, you know, this celebration and dance and all that. So I think it's from all those memories of my childhood, you know, where my mom and our neighbors used to do this dancing in the kitchen and all that. That's where this poem came from. So I'll be reading that. So it's called Nostalgia in Vibe. Hot air blows the song across the length of our barrack squatters corridor. African woman go dance. She go dance, fire dance, fella in books. As our neighbor, Mama Odion's lace wrapper clad hips, carved and winging like a thunderbird, takes flight into a storm of celebratory deluge. And from our kitchen, directly across the block, mother joins the chorus of swaying hips, the scents from both kitchens mingling in a heavily flavored tangle of wet heat, like lovers sharing a hot, aromatic kiss. And as the song explodes into one of Fela's percussion-infused interludes, the women undulate a duet of rhythmic jigging, a spectacular easy wandering to joy. Elsewhere, the beagle blows its monotone routine, soundtrack for this barrack living. Oblivious, their bodies steeped in this blood-curdled, wholehearted effusion of movement, echoes of a history written in tribal drumming. It was in my mother's kitchen that I learned that in melanin, everything is a vibe. You know, like, <laughs> like I said, <laughs> You know, this, 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 um, I, I just started writing last year. So I'm still writing from memories, you know, like childhood memories from experiences. I'm still exploring per se my own poetics, you know, and this, this memory sort of really stands out for me, how, you know, we can pull joy, we can pull movement out of, even the darkest of times, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still one of those. Someone called me recently, one of my contemporaries here in Nigeria said, I'm a happy Nigerian poet. <laughs> I said, not really, <laughs> but I just, I just love to explore this, you know, sometimes an environment can be so dark, you know, it can be so like depressing. You just born into something, you know, it's not, that's not all we are. We are so much more than this, but sometimes the systems that are bound can just be so depressing. And I feel like poetry is something that helps you through, you know, 
takes you through, helps you go through life. You know, the humanities, the arts is, is like, that's what we really have here to help us with dealing with some of these systemic issues that, you know, we have here. So I'm gonna be reading another poem from, um, as Kai mentioned, the uh, Contemporary Anthology of Nigerian Poets. It's called Bougainvillea, which is uh, like a, you know, it, I mean, I know everybody knows this, the flower is, uh, it's, it's not native to Nigeria per se. It's, I think it was brought in by the colonialists, you know, it's, it's an imported um, plant, but everywhere you look, even here in Abuja, you know, we use it to decorate houses as a fence, you know, people plant them in their gardens and all that. And I think I wrote something about it for that collection. And I love this poem so much because it just reminds me of the fact that, you know, there's beauty, you know, it's a, it's a plant that has thorns, you know, but there's beauty in the most mundane of things, you know, it's a plant you find everywhere, but the beauty of it, you know, I love it. So Bungavilia, my fingertips, scented and nectar sweetened, fretted in dry season blossoms, tender and spike shone, split with familiar ache, bungavilliard. The blooms, bold and vining, petals skyward pointing, as if praying, all votive. The way humans yearn for beauty, avid and ravenous, like a candle, leaf, and flickering, races to burn itself out. Eager, I pluck at them and leave bits of myself, human sacrifice for the perennial altar. Because beauty rarely leaves you unskated when she touches you. She splits you open, tender soft, like new birth, a sacred thing. You know, so I say, <laughs> I say about my poetics, really, that's why I, <laughs> I love Patricia so much. I say about my poetics, like, I love nature, nature and place. I love the symbolism of, you know, life. I love the Afro symbolism. We have so many traditions, culture. You know, we live in this century where it's like, okay, it's the global world we're globalizing, you know, and sometimes it's easy to forget the things that we grew up with, you know, the culture. Sometimes we leave them behind. I mean, I have friends who don't even visit the village, you know, they don't go to villages anymore. I have a child, he's eight now, and it's a struggle for us to learn and to communicate, you know, in our native tongue. So sometimes the culture gets left behind as we're globalizing, nature gets left behind, you know, but I love to center these things in my writing. I love to center them in my writing. So that's what I did with this poem. I don't know if I have time to read another one, Kai. Do I have time? Okay, okay, thank you. So this one I'm gonna be reading, the next one I'm gonna be reading is called, um, Peeling you back. What happened was that um, 12 years ago, I lost my sibling, you know, to domestic violence. And then she was pregnant. So it was like a double loss. You know, the whole family is looking forward to meeting the baby. She was already six months pregnant, had some kind of argument with her partner and, you know, complications and she died. You know, if you've ever been through any kind of loss, if you've ever been through any kind of pain, violence, trauma, anything, when it happens to you, the pain can be so sharp at the moment. You know, it's like you're trying to look into the sun. The glare is so bright, you can hardly stand it. So when I say writing last year, I just, and then of course, I'm talking about 12 years ago now. <laughs> so, but I couldn't write about that pain. It took me a while, it took me like, this is like a year plus now and I just started writing poetry. You know, it took me a while to get into writing it. 
But I also sometimes in this same thing about movement, life is about movement, you know, nature moves and all that. Time moves and with that movement, you find that um, not that it takes the pain away, doesn't take the injury away, doesn't take, you know, the issue away, but it just makes it maybe, maybe bearable, I should say, or maybe you just find a way, you know, to move through that experience. You move with it. You go along with it. You know, something happens to you. You have the scars to prove that this thing happened, but you can go back. You just move forward. So that's what I did with this. This is a relatively new poem. I hope you all like it. It's called Peeling You Back. Not that the crackling song of a snake unloading old skin is me being startled by the pain of your absence. Apparently, we are always admitting to evolution. Being alive is praying for absolution from every ugliness our bodies home. Even if God cut out the legs from under us with this cruelty of having to function while bearing the weight of our inevitability, we still beg these raindrops. Be reasonable with your journeys. Despite the river's trajectory, smoothing over every jagged rock it banks, the pain is unlessened for the beauty that is to come. This is how time is moving over the memory of you with the possibility to forgive that transgression, or at the very least, scraping it to a bearable ache. Love, see the yes, I feel appealing you back to me so fondly. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing, Jackie. Oh my God. Thank you. That was so beautiful. Thank you. Also, like, I don't know what, but your intro to the last poem I found really moving. Um, Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Ah, there was a line. Uh, this is how time is moving over the memory of you, which is unbelievable. That is so good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Kai. Thank you. Hey, listen, it's an absolute pleasure. And I will... I've, it's a bit weird, isn't it, having the spotlight just on you like that? So I'll take it away. <laughs> um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I found that really, really moving. Um, I'm having trouble making my voice strong. <laughs> um, in a good way, in the best way possible. Um, thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you. So, moving on. Um, we now welcome, last but not least, Patricia is an Indo-Swiss writer based in London. Her latest pamphlet, Bulbul Calling, was published by Bitter Melon Press in 2020. Uh, I have a copy. I will safely say I think it is one of the most beautiful books as a book uh, I've ever beheld. It's printed on Risa Graf with the most beautiful purple and green and... Um, that's by Bitter Melon, which is uh, at Nina Powell's press, I believe. Um, she co-edits Amber Flora, which is the zine that Jackie uh, mentioned. Uh, she writes poetry, prose and reviews. Um, really, really pleased Patricia's here with us tonight. Um, it was slightly last minute, but, you know, here we are. It's all worked out. Um, so hopefully yeah him. there we go yes. okay great patricia i'm now going to hand over to you thank you for joining us um yeah cool um well thank you for having me and for inviting me you know last minute and so on it's so so amazing to be here it's so amazing to be reading amongst poets i really admire rachel her new book has just arrived at, at my flat in london and i just can't wait to get back and read it um but i've admired her work for a long time and andre this is the first time i've, I've actually heard andre read and i think that essay was just amazing phenomenal and um 
people tree press is, is just a place that I've been like looking to for so long like throughout university just so admiring of the work they do and we are so honored to publish Jackie and Amber Flora um, she's this amazing vivacious writer and I think she brings out so much in her work and I just think it's incredible to be able to read with all of you tonight um, and I'm actually going to be reading from uh, a little bit from Night Waters as well, which uh, was published in 2018 with Zarf, as well as uh, Bulbul Calling, which was published this year with Bitter Melon, as, as Kai had um, mentioned. So I'll just start off with a poem from Night Waters. This one is called Laguna. The ocean turns green algae into light, swallows its green, washes its own memory. The ocean braids its hair, sadness split into three. August brushing my hands like palm fronds. When the monsoon comes, the trees loosen their braids, sing the wind sorrows into water. All of this water, the sadness of a knowledge. Slip your shadow into the sea, drag silt from your own mouth. And this one is called New Moon Scorpio. Solitude, then solace, like a summer returning over and over. My feet rubbed raw by the violent wind. Quiet like the Narcissus, quiet like the frozen panorama of spring. What Narcissus? I saw nothing but the hair on your arms, cold and sharp in the winter sun. Your feet dancing in the rain, a lucid dream lucent sound. Once, many nights ago, I was bitten. Tonight, the new moon is in Scorpio. Your voice like the smell of wet grass seeped through the night. In the desert, they arranged tobacco leaves around the tent. November narcissus, the invisible flower, the night fear, or the visible winter, your empty eyes. Inward, like the scorpion sting, like the sting of an irreversible thing. The summer, a thousand summers, spinning on the quietest axis. The poisoned landscape, the winter without end. And I'm going to read from Bulbul Calling as well. I was on a reading yesterday and I just feel like if anybody is watching again today, you must all be so bored. <laughs> this will be short and sweet. Um, I'll try to read different things at least. All right, I'm going to read Immersion. Dissolving, textured string and part garment. Here, the final gnaw, the moving fall. Unweaving my threads from this pain. Your shadow like a phantom on the wall. In the silence sits a humid sadness through which I journey, still imprisoned. A night's pristine light desiccating its small shower across my face, the privacy of a bruise. Quiet grief. He is with me, his cold hair, his lingering breaths brushing tendrils. In the wet darkness, a green current enters the room. Eyes of the rain, open and alive, searching. Invincible light, streaming through bone, she said, white heat for healing, perforated body shedding its rind, transforming into belief, a heartbeat, and then leaves, leaves, leaves. The dark preserves translucency, allows me to walk barefoot, pry apart the oblique, for these damp roots, for this immersion. Um, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read Sea Song, which I haven't read very often. I believe we can find it waiting under our newly formed nails. The word swings like a plantain leaf, its broad green smiling the sunlight. Rhythm crashing with the waves. Broken shells passed around to listen to whispers. We hear the sand overwhelming itself with the glass it's about to become, a murmuring. 
The fish flee from us, their fins pushing vastly away the sea light. There's nothing you can do. I lean against the curved body of the beach, expecting more, making a big noise about the undoneness of things, making no noise about the reasons I've counted to wait, nonetheless. I'm remaking a life here among the plantains. The movements of the fox across our garden at night, traced in the snow, are a lifetime away. And finally, I'm going to read Name Ghazal. These arcane words, conjured out of nothing, form shorn, Godspeed breaking at the shore. I pulled your name out of the sea, they said, and we played Balanguri, laughing at the shore. A slow star passing above, we sit and watch the eyelash of sleep surfacing at the shore. We are aware of the same things stopped in time, the morning skin color flickering at the shore. I dream grotesque of midnight cyclones and the numbers of bodies piling at the shore. Our names ancient in remembered texts, divinity and existence unfolding at the shore. Refugee, immigrant, expat, all moneyed apart, but we all arrive at the shore. The names pour blood when slowest open, run into the water flowing at the shore. We sign our names on a thousand petitions, injustices, intimate knowledge growing at the shore. By the sea, an open shrine, open wounds, a dark body gazes sitting at the shore. Candlelit and unfamiliar, your eyes at sunset. Your words are buried and dissolving at the shore. Our true witness is with our names. Speak, Pratyusha, of everything at the shore. And that's all. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Patricia. Amazing poems. Um, particularly pertinent, that last one at the moment. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> sadly. At the, yeah. Thank you very much no um, for joining us from across the shores. Always. Um, yeah. Cool. Right, folks. Um, that brings us that brings us to the end of our readers. Um, I hope you hope you enjoyed it. Um, I had various emotions and stages of emotions throughout the whole thing. I'm still feeling a bit goosebumpy. Um, and slightly uh, like it's not actually a muggy day, like a bit whew, like rattled in a really good way. Um, I hope the same is true for you guys at home. Um, yeah, thanks for joining. I don't really have anything left to say apart from thank you to everyone. Um, so I will now pass back to Henry who will say a few extra words. Readers, by the way, stay on the line. Just. Hello, uh, back on. Um, thank you everyone again, um, to Rachel, Jackie, Andre, Patricia, and Kai for those wonderful readings. A few comments from the YouTube chat that I don't know if the readers saw. Um, a few people highlighting different parts of the poems from Rachel's um, knocking on the stained glass because they're still barbaric. Wonderful line. Um, and follows saying that all that's left is the speed of it. One of many beautiful lines in the first essay. Um, Ryan on uh, that meditation on Hutchinson and sense of place, the way of comparison so beautiful. Chris Yates. Uh, Chris Yates is saying to Jackie, wonderful, and it was really good to hear you talk about the poems in your introductions. Very moving. I, I agree. It was really, really good to hear, hear you talk about that. Um, and thank you for sharing. Um, lots of people saying goosebumps. <laughs> I agree. Um, so just to round up on what we have coming next, the next event is on September the 3rd, which is an of and by event um, hosted and organized by Jonathan P. Watts. The, the event is 
focused on the Norwich Women's Film Weekend, reclaiming the history of a unique feminist event. Teresa Grimes, Jeanette uh, Vincendu, Caroline Mertz, Biddy Fisher and Elizabeth B will be here to discuss the origins, the life and evolution of the annual Norwich Women's Film Weekend that was from 1979 to 1989. Um, then on September the 17th, we have Echoed Structure, Structured Echo, which is a digital material dialogue using Samuel Beckett's The Nameable as a Catalyst. Um, and that will be by And But, um, which is a group of three people, Carl Foster, Kimberly Foster, and Victoria Mitchell. Um, so once again, thank you to everyone for tuning in. I see Carl and Kimberly Foster just said thanks to all lovely poems. Um, and we hope to see you in two weeks. Um, stay, stay safe. <laughs>